And now chapter 29, Krishna and the gopis meet for the Ras dance. Bhattarayani, or Shukdev Goswami, said, Sri Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, full in all opulences. Yet upon seeing those autumn nights scented with blossoming jasmine flowers, he turned his mind toward loving affairs. To fulfill his purposes, he employed his internal potency. The moon then rose, anointing the face of the western horizon with the reddish hue of his comforting rays, and thus dispelling the pain of all who watched him rise. The moon was like a beloved husband who returns after a long absence and adorns the face of his beloved wife with red kunkum. Lord Krishna saw the unbroken disk of the full moon glowing with the red effulgence of newly applied vermilion as if it were the face of the goddess of fortune. He also saw the Kumuda lotuses opening in response to the moon's presence and the forest gently illumined by its rays. Thus the Lord began to play sweetly on his flute, attracting the minds of the beautiful-eyed gopis. of Vrindavan heard Krishna's flute song, which arouses romantic feelings. Their minds were captivated by the Lord. They went to where their lover waited, each unknown to the others, moving so quickly that their earrings swung back and forth. Some of the gopis were milking cows when they heard Krishna's flute. They stopped milking and went off to meet him. Some left milk curdling on the stove, and others left cakes burning in the oven. Some of them were getting dressed, feeding milk to their infants, or rendering personal service to their husbands. But they all gave up these duties and went to meet Krishna. Other gopis were taking their evening meals, washing themselves, putting on cosmetics, or applying kajula to their eyes. But all the gopis stopped these activities at once, and, though their clothes and ornaments were in complete disarray, rushed off to Krishna. Their husbands, fathers, brothers, and other relatives tried to stop them, but Krishna had already stolen their hearts. Enchanted by the sound of his flute, they refused to turn back. Some of the gopis, however, could not manage to get out of their houses, and instead they remained home with eyes closed, meditating upon him in pure love. For those gopis who could not go to see Krishna, intolerable separation from their beloved, caused an intense agony that burned away all impious karma. By meditating upon him they realized his embrace, and the ecstasy they then felt exhausted their material piety. Although Lord Krishna is the Supreme Soul, these girls simply thought of him as their male lover and associated with him in that intimate mood. Thus their karmic bondage was nullified and they abandoned their gross material bodies. O oh, sage, the gopis knew Krishna only as their lover, not as the supreme absolute truth. So how could these girls, their minds caught up in the waves of the modes of nature, free themselves from material attachment? This point was explained to you previously. Since even Shishupal, who hated Krishna, achieved perfection, then what to speak of the Lord's dear devotees? O King, the Supreme Lord is inexhaustible and immeasurable, and He is untouched by the material modes because He is their controller. 
His personal appearance in this world is meant for bestowing the highest benefit on humanity. Persons who constantly direct their lust, anger, fear, protective affection, feeling of impersonal oneness or friendship toward Lord Hari are sure to become absorbed in thought of him. You should not be so astonished by Krishna, the unborn master of all masters of mystic power, the supreme personality of Godhead. After all, it is the Lord who liberates this world. Seeing that the girls of Raja had arrived, Lord Krishna, the best of speakers, greeted them with charming words that bewildered their minds. Lord Krishna said, O most fortunate ladies, welcome. What may I do to please you? Is everything well in Vraja? Please tell me the reason for your coming here. This night is quite frightening, and frightening creatures are lurking about. Return to Vraja, slender-waisted girls. This is not a proper place for women. Not finding you at home, your mothers, fathers, sons, brothers and husbands are certainly searching for you. Don't cause anxiety for your family members. Now you have seen this Vrindavan forest full of flowers and resplendent with the light of the full moon. You have seen the beauty of the trees with their leaves trembling in the gentle breeze coming from the Yamuna. So now go back to the cowherd village. Don't delay. O oh, chaste ladies, serve your husbands and give milk to your crying babies and calves. On the other hand, perhaps you have come here out of your great love for me, which has taken control of your hearts. This is of course quite commendable on your part, since all living entities possess natural affection for me. The highest religious duty for a woman is to sincerely serve her husband, behave well toward her husband's family, and take good care of her children. Women who desire a good destination in the next life should never abandon a husband who has not fallen from his religious standards, even if he is obnoxious, unfortunate, old, unintelligent, sickly, or poor. For a woman from a respectable family, petty, adulterous affairs are always condemned. They bar her from heaven, ruin her reputation, and bring her difficulty and fear. Transcendental love for me arises by the devotional processes of hearing about me, seeing my deity form, meditating on me, and faithfully chanting my glories. The same result is not achieved by mere physical proximity. So please go back to your homes. Hearing these unpleasant words spoken by Govinda, the gopis became morose. Their great hopes were frustrated and they felt insurmountable anxiety. Their heads hanging down and their heavy sorrowful breathing drying up their reddened lips, the gopis scratched the ground with their toes. Tears flowed from their eyes, carrying their kajula and washing away the vermilion smeared on their breasts. Thus they stood, silently bearing the burden of their unhappiness. Although Krishna was their beloved, and although they had abandoned all other objects of desire for his sake, he had been speaking to them unfavorably. Nonetheless, they remained unflinching in their attachment to him. Stopping their crying, they wiped their eyes and began to speak, their voices stammering with agitation. The beautiful gopis said, all-powerful one, you should not speak in this cruel way. Do not reject us, who have renounced all material enjoyment to render devotional service to your lotus feet. Reciprocate with us, O stubborn one, just as the primeval Lord, Sri Narayan, reciprocates with his devotees in their endeavors for liberation. Our dear Krishna, as an expert in religion, you have advised us that the proper religious duty for women is to faithfully serve their husbands, children, and other relatives. We agree that this principle is valid, but actually this service should be rendered to you. 
after all, O Lord. You are the dear most friend of all embodied souls. You are their most intimate relative, and indeed, their very self. Expert transcendentalists always direct their affection toward you, because they recognize you as their true self and eternal beloved. What use do we have for these husbands, children, and relatives of ours, who simply give us trouble? Therefore, O Supreme Controller, grant us your mercy. O Lotus Eyed One, please do not cut down our long-cherished hope to have your association. Until today, our minds were absorbed in household affairs, but you easily stole both our minds and our hands away from our housework. Now our feet won't move one step from your lotus feet. How can we go back to Russia? What would we do there? Dear Krishna, please pour the nectar of your lips upon the fire within our hearts. A fire you ignited with your smiling glances and the sweet song of your flute. If you do not, we will consign our bodies to the fire of separation from you, O oh friend. And thus, like yogis, Attain the abode of your lotus feet by meditation. O lotus-eyed one, the goddess of fortune considers it a festive occasion whenever she touches the soles of your lotus feet, who are very dear to the residents of the forest, and therefore we will also touch those lotus feet. From that time on, we will be unable to even stand in the presence of any other man, for we will have been fully satisfied by you. Goddess Lakshmi, whose glance is sought after by the demigods with great endeavor, has achieved the unique position of always remaining on the chest of her lord, Narayan. Still, she desires the dust of his lotus feet, even though she has to share that dust with Tulsi Devi, and indeed with the lord's many other servants. Similarly, we have approached the dust of your lotus feet for shelter. Therefore, O vanquisher of all distress, please show us mercy. To approach your lotus feet, we abandon our families and homes, and we have no desire other than to serve you. Our hearts are burning with intense desires generated by your beautiful smiling glances. O jewel among men, please make us your maidservants. Seeing your face encircled by curling locks of hair, your cheeks beautified by earrings, your lips full of nectar, and your smiling glance, and also seeing your two imposing arms, which take away our fear, and your chest, which is the only source of pleasure for the goddess of fortune, we must become your maidservants. Dear Krishna, what woman in all the three worlds wouldn't deviate from religious behavior when bewildered by the sweet, drawn-out melody of your flute? Your beauty makes all three worlds auspicious. Indeed, even the cows, birds, trees, and deer manifest the ecstatic symptom of bodily hair standing on end when they see your beautiful form. Clearly, you have taken birth in this world to relieve the fear and distress of the people of Raja, just as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Primeval Lord, protects the domain of the demigods. Therefore, O friend of the distressed, kindly place your lotus hand on your maidservants' heads and burning breasts. Smiling upon hearing these despondent words from the gopis, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Master of all masters of mystic yoga, mercifully enjoyed with them, although he is self-satisfied. Among the assembled gopis, the infallible Lord Krishna appeared just like the moon surrounded by stars. He whose activities are so magnanimous made their faces blossom with his affectionate glances, and his broad smiles revealed the effulgence of his jasmine bud-like teeth. As the gopis sang his praises, that leader of hundreds of women sang loudly in reply, 
He moved among them wearing his Vijayanti garland, beautifying the Vrindavan forest. Sri Krishna went with the gopis to the bank of the Yamuna, where the sand was cooling and the wind, enlivened by the river's waves, bore the fragrance of lotuses. There Krishna threw his arms around the gopis and embraced them. He aroused Cupid in the beautiful young ladies of Vraja by touching their hands, hair, thighs, belts, and breasts, by playfully scratching them with his fingernails, and also by joking with them, glancing at them, and laughing with them. In this way the Lord enjoyed his pastimes. The gopis became proud of themselves for having received such special attention from Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and each of them thought herself the best woman on earth. Lord Keshava, seeing the gopis too proud of their good fortune, wanted to relieve them of this pride and show them further mercy. Thus he immediately disappeared. Thus ends the 29th chapter of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Krishna and the Gopis Meet for the Ras Dance.